Welcome everyone to our Career Edge webinar series. This was created by your CU Denver Business School Alumni Network. Throughout this series, we're hoping to provide you with information on being really successful in your career and helping you with all your professional skill set. Thanks for joining us, and we're going to have a great session today that's focused on designing your life. So before we get started, with some introductions, I want to let you all know that we'll be taking questions. So you can um, make sure you use the Q&A function um, that's on your screen to submit questions at any time. We'll get to many, as many of them as possible, but at the end um, our, of our discussion today. Uh, additionally, we will be sending all attendees a link to this recording of this presentation and any references that refer to. So with that, Let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Carrie Ungama, and I am the Chief of Staff and Assistant Dean of Marketing at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. I was the past inaugural chair of the Business School Alumni Network uh, and past president of the CU Denver Alumni Board. And with that, I'm gonna introduce who our um, presenter is today. The wonderful Maggie Graham is the assistant director um, here at the CU Denver Business School and in our career, um, career connections team. In her former roles, she supported hundreds of job seekers in determining their focus for their next professional chapter, identifying their brand, creating their accomplishment statements, and landing really coveted positions. She's an expert on job search and professional development, and she guides our students and alumni to leverage their time so that they produce the results such as engagement with targeted connections, expanded networks, and really optimizing their resumes and LinkedIn profiles. She has developed workshops and tools to provide guidance in recognizing their strengths, accessing their passions and purpose, and focusing on their searches to land the positions that really fit them for what they want. Welcome, Maggie, and thanks for walking through us with us today. Yeah, I'm so glad that we're doing this today. And so what we're going to do today is get started with now hearing about you. Uh, and we would love for you to put in chat um, in just a few minutes after I tell you everything what we're going to do today, but we're going to want to know where you're calling from. Um, and we have a poll that we'll follow up that chat with um, just to get an idea of who's on the call and what you're, where you are in your path. I'll tell you about designing your life and how it came to fruition. We'll also talk about what in the book they call dysfunctional beliefs, but I prefer to call myths. And so we'll bust some of those open. And then also how this particular methodology works around career change or pivot. And then we'll look at some tools that are specific to this particular approach. And then um, as Carrie said, we're gonna end with Q&A. So we'll leave ample time for that. So what we would love for you to do is go ahead and put into chat where you're zooming in from. So we would love to know if that's um, as specific as you wanna be, where, where, whether it's just your home office or whether you're on campus today, um, if you're calling in from somewhere other than Denver or other than Colorado, let us know. Um, and make sure when you're chatting that you tell us all, all of the panelists that you can just select just to send us, but it's kind of nice to know where everyone is. Um, so it looks like we have some CU-centric people. Oh, and Denver-centric. That's great. Oh, Boulder, too. That's nice. Um, this is great. Centennial. Somebody from the D Denver Tech Center, which is really nice. Oh, we also have Boston and Aurora. Broomfield, oh, Arvada. Oh, my goodness. From all over. Oh, um, Tucson, Arizona. I was born there. So props out to our, our Tucson uh, contingent. Louisville or Louisville, Colorado. I thought it was going to be Louisville, Kentucky. You say those differently, don't you? <laughs> oh, and this is fun, too. We've got somebody who's in Human Centered Design Lab. That's great. So while continue to go ahead and do that. And then let's go ahead and put up our 
whole because it also will help us to know where you are as far as your career. And um, we do have an, an other selection that you'll see at the bottom. But, you know, if you're just, if you're feeling like, hey, I'm doing pretty well, but I really like to always take advantage of these opportunities that the BSAN offers. Um, and somebody's already selected that one. Um, some people would describe themselves as maybe being a little restless, but just kind of not knowing where to go. Absolutely. Um, careers are always changing and, you know, depending where you're at, it's, it's really great to know. Yeah. So, and often I hear from people who are just like overflowing with ideas um, and that they just can't pick between them. Um, and then there's people who also have gone like way past their tolerance level and they're just itching to make a change. So just as Carrie and I are seeing these come in and you'll be able to see the results and, and we'll run it for maybe another 30 seconds. Um, but right now it's looking like most of the people are just a little restless um, with just one person who's out of patience. Um, but then the other people are pretty evenly split between the other choices. Yeah, and it looks like um, we also have someone who's looking to getting back into um, their career path and their professional uh, life. And um, some are bursting with ideas, um, but have some flexibility. And so felt like they could answer several of these. Yeah, and the beauty of this approach, and we'll go ahead and close the poll and display so you can see where um, the other people on the call are. Um, but the beauty of the designing your life approach is this works with people across the spectrum of either readiness as far as making a change or you know across the age spectrum across um, different careers whether you're wanting just to make a slight shift or whether you want to make a huge leap so all of this will be applicable um, and so let's go ahead and get into the content here and look at uh, what is the thing designing your life? And some of you may have already picked up the book and, and are familiar with it, but I'm gonna start at the beginning for people who just, you know, might have heard a little bit of buzzing about it and are curious. And so what you'll see this picture of me with Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. I got to go out to San Francisco to be in their inaugural coach training program. Um, and I felt a little bit like a middle schooler at a rock concert with my favorite performers um, so because I was enamored of this approach as soon as it came out in um, fall of 2016 but the way it started was Bill and Dave uh, were teaching a class at Stanford um, both of them are professors there and they continue to teach this class about career exploration and life design and their original description for the class was it's something that teaches you what you want to be when you grow up um, or what you want to do next as you continue growing um, so their approach it's not so much a destination as a process and what happened was as they taught the course through several iterations, it became really popular. Um, and years later, people would come back and say, um, you know, we, they were former students and um, they just felt the ongoing impact from the class later into their career. Um, and then there started to become a little bit of a ripple where people who weren't Stanford students um, wanted to take the class. And um, that's what led Bill and Dave to write the book, which incorporates the key activities and the fundamental principles um, that they use in their course. And they actually hired a ghostwriter. Neither one of them are authors or aspired to be authors. Um, and they talked about the process of sort of birthing this book as being kind of agonizing. Um, but the result is this New York Times bestseller. Um, and the book has been adapted in and it's used in other universities for coursework, but also both Bill and Dave speak inside corporations and across the globe 
um, around design thinking as it applies to your career. Um, it's kind of become a little bit of a movement. And I liken it to the classic book. Have you heard that book, Carrie? I oh, have. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the What Color Is Your Parachute is mm -hmm. you know, kind of back in the day um, was the book that people were reading back then. Right, and so I call this the modern version of what color is your parachute. And it's really taken hold in the market in the same way. So I, I wanna tell you what I mean by design principles. Um, which is, you know, most of us, if we've never heard of design thinking, but basically we, we think of it as like interior design. And, um, you know, it's like, okay, if you're redesigning your living room, what colors are optimized? But design thinking is very different from that idea. It's really innovation methodology. Um, and it's a framework for an, for um, product and process, process development that's used in high tech. In fact, Bill Burnett um, got his start working for Apple designing the first mouse. So it's it's an approach that is both about the function and the appearance of products. And it's fundamentally human or user design centered. And so what the book does is it takes the tenets of design thinking and overlays it on career and life construction. Um, so just to illustrate this, I wanna give a contrast to design thinking and engineering thinking. So engineering thinking is where you would solve your way forward. Like if you were gonna build a bridge, you have bounded problems with reliable data. But we talk about design thinking, the best application for it is what's called a wicked problem. And so there's four dimensions of a wicked problem. It's open-ended, it's lacking data, it's ambiguous, and essentially you're inventing the future. Um, and so we would say design thinking is instead of solving your way forward, which is what engineering would do, you're building your way forward. So you build and discover over and over in small iterations and change rapidly. So what we wanna do now is talk about uh, the myths that tend to show up around this process. Um, and th so the book itself uncovers what they call dysfunctional beliefs. So they cover 20 dysfunctional beliefs. Um, and I, I prefer to think of them as myths because they really show up in our discourse as we're looking at career. Um, and so they say these things are untrue, ungenerative, they're not helpful, and often they actually get in the way of forward progress. Um, so this first one that I want to talk about um, is, and I hear this over and over from students, yes, and I'm sure absolutely. you hear it because you're in academia too, right? right? Yes, absolutely. There's so much, and I hear this from alumni too, where I selected the wrong major. So there's a lot of regret around that. But we actually say that um, th this is, when we look at the data, um, within 10 years of graduation, 80% of people um, with bachelor's degree are working outside their major field of study. So the correlation between what you do and what you studied is very, very low. There are a lot of other variables that drive your direction, like internships, relationship currency, your ability to influence authority. Um, so uh, let's go to the next one. The next one, I am, how many, like, have you probably heard this, Carrie? Haven't you? Like, I have. Yeah, I definitely have. Um, especially with students that I um, have the opportunity to encounter with. Um, there's a lot of stress saying, well, I like a lot of things, but I don't know what my passion is, so I don't know what next step, and it becomes kind of a roadblock. Exactly, and so what happens, they, that, so I think this is the most toxic of all the career beliefs, be, partly because so many people think it's true, um, and 
one of the things that um, Dave Evans said is we've kind of gotten this reputation, he and Bill, as the anti-passion people. And he said, that's not true at all. And this is a direct quote from him that I have to read really slowly because I'm like, it just it makes my head explode. He said, we're anti-presuppositional singular passion as an organizing principle preceding all other behaviors. Or another way to say that is you knew up front what your path would be and what your passion was and that that's the principle that drives everything and it makes you all be totally okay. Um, but when you look at the people who are on the other side of this, um, eight out of 10 people. So again, it's that 80% number. Right. So way more than half will answer the passion question with, with something like, I don't know, or which one? Or like, what's the one we should do? Exactly. And this is another quote from Bill and Dave, which is, passion is the outcome not the input. It's the end of the game, not the beginning, which I love because it, um, it's saying it's through the process of exploration that you ignite your passion. You don't need to have that spark at the beginning. So let's look at this last myth. Touch on that. Um, I call this the compare and despair. This is because we have social media that gives us just this tiny little sliver of a picture of what other people's lives looks like. And um, so it, it also becomes really entrenched where people, um, I hear over and over from people who are like, my peers are ahead of me. I should be further along by now. And I should also have that five-year plan. I should know what I'm doing and be earnestly working towards that. Um, and this is the thing that happens is if we spend time agonizing about whether we're behind, all we do is just stay stuck. Um, and we don't harvest that restlessness that people um, indicated is seems to be driving a lot of people at this point. Um, and one of the other things is I think it's not fair to judge your younger self, even if it was somebody, you know, your younger self three months ago that did not have the insight that you have now. Um, that you're using the experiences that you've had to come to discernment and to come to clarity. Um, even if they were little inklings or glimmers before, you couldn't have grabbed them, you know, until you got to this place. So a big part is um, owning where you are and beginning at this point rather than stepping into agony. Uh, so let's segue here into what is this? What are design principles? Um, so these are the core tenets of the design thinking process that they outlined in the book. And actually there is, Stanford has what's called the D school. So, it, and it's pretty well known where they teach design thinking principles for application in corporations. Um, so these same principles apply to you and your career. Um, and so the first one is one of the central pieces because I hear this from people all the time where they'll come in with what I call a solution disguised as a problem. And so that sounds something like, oh, I need a new boss. <laughs> Because, and this happens a lot because people have identified this is the pathway for me to have relief from whatever I'm itching around or struggling with. Whereas, in fact, there, if you frame a question instead of what's wrong with my boss, it becomes what is the um, disconnect between me communicating my ambitions to my boss or helping my boss understand my insights. Um, so that it's not necessarily that I need to switch out that person, it's that I need to find a way to be able to release and express with um, a productive route um, how I'm going to get to where I'm going, which is you being able to flow with ideas, you being able to build and apply what it is, the insights that you have. 
Um, and so the reason that there's a picture too, there's a second illustration of this um, that they use in the book, which the reason there's a picture of some guy standing here with a ladder is because a lot of times, even in um, product design groups, they'll be saying, okay, well, we need to add, figure out how to build the highest ladder to access our shell, upper shelves in our warehouse. But that's actually the wrong problem. The problem is, how do we access these high shelves? It could be from like a drone or, you know, some other system, robotic arms. Um, so instead of spending all of your time and resources figuring out the best ladder, you actually need to get to the right question first. So that's the first step of the process. Um, so, and I just want to close that one bullet, which is a design thinker would say most problems are solution masquerading as a problem. So think about that for yourself as you have defined what your problem is. See if you can take a step back and look at it from a different perspective. Um, so empathy and curiosity are big in this process as well. A lot of times I'll hear from people with skepticism where, oh, that won't work. Or I know somebody who has used that approach and um, it didn't work. And when you look at it more with empathy for yourself and the other people in this situation um, and drive curiosity around that, um, you're much more likely to find a solution. Um, so how can we think about creativity rather than just logic and linear process thinking? Um, and there are activities in the book that bring you access to your right brain. They use things like mind mapping um, and uh, idea um, graphs to be able to not just get into the classic pros and cons list. Um, and so then the other pieces that are on here um, are how can we, instead of having a plan, have a bias to action? Instead of overhauling, how can we tweak? Because wholesale change, particularly for people who are in mid-career, um, are it's much more difficult. So instead of throwing out the whole thing, uh, radical con collaboration is the last tenet, and that is thinking about who can you work with, who um, would be able to support you on your journey. Okay, so let's talk about what is involved in this process. So um, in the book, they have some central tools that they use. Um, one is a dashboard where you just assess where are you in your life. Um, and one of the things I love about designing your life, I have to tell you a funny little thing. Uh, I had one of our student assistants review the slide deck before we posted it because I was like, this is going to be recorded and on there forever. And he looked at the title page and he said, this should be called Designing Your Professional Life. And I was like, that's a great suggestion, but we can't change the title of the book. <laughs> and it's also this dashboard has you assess not just on work, but um, your play, your health, and they say love, your relationships. Well, and I know someone who's used this book um, going into retirement because that was a yes. next stage going on too. So I think it has lots of applications, um, not only in your professional life. Yes, and what it does is it integrates those other parts of yourself, which I love. Um, and so I want to talk specifically about what's called the Good Times Journal. Um, so let's go ahead and advance to that. Um, because we wanted to make sure that you have something concrete that you will be able to do when you get off this webinar, even if you don't have a copy of the book. Um, and so one of the, the exercises that we identified is called the Good Times Journal. Um, and so what it does is it looks at um, how can you identify the dimensions of your life where you are in what's called flow, that state where you, you know how when you lose a sense of time, you just sort of disappear into yourself and it's really almost this enthralling energy. 
Um, and so this particular um, exercise, and we'll just go ahead and look at the next piece, which is filled in. This is actually Bill Burnett's um, filled in um, Good Times Journal. So you can see what you do is you capture the activity um, and then you put in your engagement and you can see that checkbox for the flow. Um, which you will, because that's a really helpful thing to notice what's going on within it. And you set the dial, how far, how high is your engagement? What's going on with your energy? And you can also look at how he's capturing the things that are really not great, like the faculty meeting. Well, I know we have a couple professors on the, uh, yeah. uh, um, joining us today, so. Um, it could be interesting to see how you feel about faculty meetings too. <laughs> I know. And you know what he's harvested on here too is the, those little notes there are, depends on the topic. Um, and so if we go and look at this next piece, this is one other dimension that I want you to use when you're doing this part of the process. Um, and so this is a framework that they talk about in the book, but they credit the originator, um, which you'll see here on the screen. And they say, you look at this through the AEIOU framework. What are the activities you're doing? What environments are you in? I think interactions is one of the most important variables. Who is with who is with you and what are you doing with them? Are you connected to objects? And this is another piece that's huge in career, which is who who are the end users? And this is big because meaning is central to career fulfillment. If we can identify and recognize who the end users are and have even just a small sense of who that is, that massively will elevate our, um, our sense of fulfillment within the work that we're doing. So um, as we start to wrap up and get into our Q&A, I did want to let you know that part of the follow-up for this uh, email that you'll receive after the webinar, not just the recording, but also we are going to have a 2020 design team for BSAN members. Um, and so you'll see the specifics here on this slide about um, when it's going to be held and what's going to be happening there. And so we'll put in chat my email address and also in the email that you will receive, you'll have instructions about how to register for that um, because it is limited to just 10 participants. Um, there is no fee, but we do ask you to get a copy of the book. Um, and so you'll, you'll find more out about that in the um, follow-up email which is such a really exciting opportunity to then um, have this free opportunity to actually work through the book as a collaborative group, um, which is one of the optimal ways. Obviously, you can um, do all of this by yourself and, and that's why the book was created, but having that community to work through is a really um, exciting opportunity coming up this coming January, uh, 10th, January 24th, February 7th, and February 21st over lunch. <laughs> so, yeah, and it'll all be via Zoom, so you can go just like you are now, coming in from the comfort of your office or your home. All right. All right. So, um, thank you, Maggie. That was really, really helpful. Um, and right now, we would love to take some questions. And we'll get to as many as we can in our uh, remaining time. So, um, and any that we aren't able to get to um, in our time that we have remaining, um, we will answer and then send out with our follow-ups. So we will make sure we answer all your questions. Yeah, so let us know what's lingering for you from all of the content that we just threw at you between the design principles or if you have interest in a particular activity. Oh, somebody wanted to know if the design team is in person. It's not, it's via Zoom, but we, in that situation, you'll be able to see the other participants because you can have the webcam on. It, I love Zoom. One of my friends calls it the Hollywood Squares or the Brady Bunch <laughs> because you can see everybody else right. who's on there, which is really nice. Um, okay, where would I start if I don't have the book? That is a great question.
question. Um, and so I would say, really, it's this good times journal that we, and, and we'll send you the outline for that so that you can have that. Uh, but basically it can really help to have um, an idea. And they suggest in the book that you do it for three weeks uh, because that way you capture not just during work, but outside of work, what types of things are you feeling really energized by and what is it that depletes you? So if you think of your energy like the water level in a well, what brings it up and what brings it down and use that A-E-I-O-U um, to have a sense of, you know, what are those variables? And here's this extra question too, which is how to use the A-E-I-O-U to evaluate career opportunities. Another great question. Um, and so what I want to say about that is often it's the, it, this happens so many times when I work with people, is the thing they think is the key variable for their career fulfillment is not. Um, and so in the AEIOU, um, it really comes back to, people think it's the activities. They think it's, oh, I get to, um, you know, be the person who is in charge of facilitating meetings. And that makes such a difference to me. Um, and really, it's actually the interactions. It's the people. Who are you with? Are those people, and actually this is something that I'm working with in a career development class that I'm teaching, which is emotional or psychological safety is the key variable. Google did a, a, a pretty famous study about teams and found that that was the key variable. So whether your interactions or your environment offer you that psychological safety, um, and then really whether you're engaging with objects that one the example i will give you around that is i often hear from people who are tired of sitting at their computers and so if that is what is depleting you because you're behind a screen all the time um, and then that last piece is do you have access to or some understanding of what your um, impact is um, on your final users and here's another uh, great question. Um, how do you know if you're just unhappy with your current job or if you're fundamentally unhappy with your career choice or path? Would the exercise that we went over about flow help discern that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there's a lot of tentacles to that um, because being unhappy with your current job can have to do either with what's happening around you or, and it's usually and, um, what your approach to it is and what your mindset is. And so I do want to introduce um, a key thing that they mention in the book, um, which is what are the variables of career fulfillment? Um, and one of them is mastery. The second one is um, purpose. So that goes in with the end user piece. Um, so autonomy is the third. And these are the things that data supports uh, really show um, career fulfillment. So I'm wondering if mastery, if you would say in your current job, you have your graph as far as your learning path is flatlined. Um, and that could be just that you need more challenge in your current role um, and it, it could also be that you're fundamentally unhappy with your career choice or your career path so yes I do that is the exercise I would start with which is the good times journal yeah and just as an example from um, my career I got my undergraduate degree in finance and was moving along um, in finance and got a new role and I was so stressed out that I was getting like fever blisters that were like um, taking over my like chin <laughs> because I was so stressed out. And I was like, I think I need to change. Like it is time. Mm -hmm. So it'd been so great if I had been able to have this book to help um, guide that process. But um, I did 
uh, I actually went back and got my degree at CU Denver and got my master's in marketing uh, to, to transition over to the marketing side of the house and it's been a great fit for me. But um, hopefully we don't want to get to the place where you're at fever blisters on your face. <laughs> yes, yes, because the World Health Organization actually just identified burnout as a health issue. Um, it's so directly related to your work stress. Um, I'm so glad you gave us that example. <laughs> Part of the reason too that I think it's so helpful to have Carrie here moderating um, and having her insight and experiences really helps to normalize career change and career restlessness. Um, and that's the glory of doing this in a group too, to realize you're not alone. Right. And then we have, um, oh, this is a great question. Uh, could you give more information to understand in the Good Times Journal um, the measure of engagement and energy? Yeah, that is a great question. And so um, here's what I would suggest on this. Um, and some of this is because right now I'm teaching this class on career development. And so it's a group of 50 students. And if I look out into the audience and a lot of them are, they, they will hide their phone underneath the table and text. Um, and so if it's a cluster of people, I'm thinking, I don't think I'm really being very engaging right now. It's a good measure for me that I'm not really captivating them. Um, and so this, you can do the same thing. Like if you feel the urge to reach for your phone or to open up a new tab on your taskbar um, when you're uh, doing a project, like for me, I'm like, let me go see what's happening on Facebook. <laughs> and so that's a good barometer of, are, is your attention strained um, when you're in the task? And if it is, your engagement is low. If you're absorbed and you're like really using self-management not to interrupt other people that you're with because you have these ideas that you want to interject or you're taking notes or you're wanting to capture things, your engagement is high. And then as far as your energy level is, if you finish a task or you feel like um, you my husband does this where he, it's almost like he'll come home and confess and he'll be like because they have free energy drinks at his work which is the worst thing because he'll go and like have his little coke or you know one of those energy like the vitamin drinks so if you feel like I keep having to prop myself up during this activity or directly following it um, that's a good sign that your energy is down. Um, so that was a great question. Um, other publications that complement Design Your Life. There are actually some really good design thinking books. Um, and so we'll include those. I, I, I don't have them fresh on the tip of my tongue, but that, thank you for that question. And we'll make sure we include a couple of titles in the follow-up email. Um, and then what do we have here? Yeah, it says, um, I recently transitioned from long-time employment. Now as I'm turning towards the next phase of the career, how do you use this resource for coaching late careerists? Yeah. Yeah, so, and I love that you're identifying where you are right now in your career because it really helps um, to realize how each of these activities can be very useful at every stage of the process. In fact, I think when um, I was telling somebody, I don't know if it was you, Carrie, mm -hmm. that we did this book as kind of a book group in my family. My mom read it, my sister read it, both of my kids who are um, college age, um, and my husband read it. And we had it as our summer vacation book. So it goes across the age spectrum. Um, so there is uh, an exercise in the book that is in chapter two, it's called Work View, Life View. And what you do, it's you basically distill, like, what is the meaning of life <laughs> in 250 words or less? And then why do you work beyond or in addition to compensation? Um, and so when you can identify those variables, they offer you this foundation for what is it that I'm seeking to amplify in my life? What is it that I want to create in this next chapter? 
Um, and so especially as you are shifting from that employment phase where it's much more of a choice, it sounds like, around how you're going to use your time, having some um, variables that will allow you to do that um, can be really useful. Um, so that's the exercise I would point you to, which is chapter two. Great. And it looks like I should have said that was our last question because that was our last question. Um, thank you everyone for your time. We will um, absolutely send out a recording of this and resources, including ideas on additional um, design, um, designing your life books that would be uh, helpful in addition to this specific book. And so look, for all of that in your follow-up email that will come in your inbox. Great. Thank you, everyone. And with this, we're going to sign off. Have a great day.